the movie was very, very impressive. I was on the edge of my seat the entire time. And it was very cool. Like, like the buildup was very, very interesting to watch. So really, really well done. Thank you. Thank you so much. What inspired the story for you? Because you also wrote the movie. I did, yes. Um, so it started out as a really a love letter to my muse, who is a, a, a woman named Julianne. She's a, a really terrific actress. We went to school together. We went to high school together, actually. And I was living in New York City. Um, this is like after the recession, 2011. And I was like, right, what am I going to do with my certificate of participation from an acting school? Because that's about the extent of my education. Um, and I couldn't get a job as an actor. Uh, so I, um, I was like, great, I'm going to write something around an actor that I know, I, I know, I know I can get a performance out of, like, I know how she performs. So I called her, I called Julianne and I said, if you could play any character, who would it be? And she said, wrote a pen mark from the bad seed, who, if you know, is a psychotic killer child. She is a full blown psychopath. Um, and so I was like, great, okay, I'm going to write about the birth of a villain. And in the play, the Cairo's journey, Cairo's journey in the play and in the movie um, are are still very similar. Like she is, she doesn't start out as as anything. She starts out as a young woman, but then as her heart breaks, she turns into something else, right? But then once I adapted it to screen, Me Too happened, and I realized I had not one villain but two. And so as I was sort of working through what I was learning through Me Too and the new feminist movement, like I was like, oh shit, like Jonathan, I didn't see what he was, just the same way he doesn't see what he is in the film. And so Beatrice sort of became that my voice of reasoning through that. Um, and I was able to explore both of those characters. I use the word villain lightly as well. I think that no character in this movie is a villain or a victim. They are all of the things, right? And that includes Boris, Beatrice, Winnie, like the whole court is out of order. Um, so it, it be I'm still learning things from the story. I'm still learning things from the character, but as I, as I was developing it up into the version that you've seen, um, I was really excited to explore characters that don't fit the binary, characters that are that are really morally and ethically gray. Yeah, that definitely was one of my favorite parts because it very much turned into, oh, no one's the hero here. Very yeah. cool. Thank so, you. Thank you. Um, I was curious because Jenna Ortega just absolutely kills it in this role. Was there a specific role she played in the past that kind of made you go, oh, she can pull off the nuance I need for Cairo? No, definitely not. I didn't really know her work very well till I met her. I'd seen The Fallout, which I'd really resisted watching because I thought it was going to be so bleak, but it's so wonderful totally totally surprised me and she's hysterical in that movie like she's so funny which is a weird thing to say about that movie because it's not necessarily funny but she's she's very funny she's very charming but when I met her on zoom she disarmed me so entirely like she is she she's from the desert I'm from Tennessee like but we both have these very similar gothic proclivities and she said things to me about the character that I had never vocalized aloud. It's like she like climbed inside of my head and said those things. So it was almost like kismet. Like people talk about the wedding dress thing, you know, and I'm like, that's not real. It is real. <laughs> like she was like, I was like, oh, you're the right wedding dress. Yes, it has to be you. And she's, I mean, sh she's extraordinary. She's so terrifying in a good way, you know? Yes, definitely. Yeah, I was very curious about kind of finding that balance with Cairo of that latchkey kid maturity because she's left <laughs> own so much while still having the teenage naivete that kind of leads her down this really dark path how did you find that balance with the character that like you said doesn't make her a victim or villain but kind of threads the needle well I mean I'm an only child I grew up in East Tennessee East and West Tennessee my parents are lawyers um I spent a lot of time um I love my parents I'm very close to my parents my parents are not Kyra's parents um but I spent a lot of time alone and um I Cairo Cairo, this movie is a, the story is a Southern Gothic and every good Southern Gothic has a ghost and that's Cairo. And it is also a little bit Jonathan, but Cairo lives alone in this mansion and she has all of these books and all of these movies at her disposal, but they're all 18th, 19th and 20th century literature and films. So they're inherently problematic. They're so behind the curve. And so when she, yes, she is so intelligent. She's like nine steps ahead of everybody at any given time. She's too big for the space that she's in, but she does not know how it works in real life. So when she idealizes Jonathan, when he hurts her, 
inevitably as he will, because he is not a strong man, she is not equipped to handle that in any real way because she has romanticized it because of the literature. And she says it at the beginning of the movie, like books and longing, like books make sing longing, longing romantic, but it's not, it's awful. And she just doesn't, she doesn't know what it really looks like. And so I think that that is very much like being a teenager, like you, especially with young women, it's not that we actually mature faster than boys. It's that we're expected to. So suddenly we have, we feel quite mature, but the boys around us still get to be kids. So of course we look to authority figures or adults as romantic figures because we feel more emotionally in line with them. Now that doesn't mean that that's correct, but right. that's how it feels. And so I think she very easily, she fools herself, you know? Definitely. And I love the like description of this as being a Southern Gothic because the buildup of tension between Cairo and Jonathan reminded me of a horror movie. So can you talk you. about kind of like building that tension and the small steps we see that it takes to cross the line? Totally. So when I describe this movie, I describe it as a romantic horror. And I think that, you know, I'm, I'm going to talk about it in two acts because it is a, it's still a play to me. So in the first act of the movie, it's it's all from Cairo's perspective. So of course it's romantic and it's deliberately too beautiful. The language is too heightened. It's all, it's all sort of a deception so that you get swept up into it. And my hope is that even though, you know, you know, it ain't right. It's so romantic that you're like, okay, okay. And then we make the turn into horror. And what I wanted that sensation to feel like is like, like you've bitten into a piece of fruit that you think is so sweet. And then you realize that sweetness is rot. And so then you've got like corpse mouth, you know, <laughs> yeah. and that, was, that was, that was the intended sensation of the movie. So thank you for, thank you for saying that. Uh, one of the things I also found very interesting is how kind of divisive the reactions were on the trailer. And I think it is because this is that post me too movement. Were you expecting that when you made the movie? Yeah. Yeah, I was. Um, you know, I think that, listen, I'd rather it be con people. I'd rather people be talking about it than people thinking it's boring, you know, yeah. like as a writer, boring is death. So whether you like it or don't like it, if you're talking about it, it's done its job. And I think when people, you know, the trailer looks away, I get it. I get the knee jerk reaction. My hope is that people go in and see that it's more nuanced than that. I hope that people go in and can have grace for characters who are not the binary. The perfect victim is boring. It's boring to write, it's boring to be. I think it is a dangerous to keep writing women as the perfect victim because it doesn't allow us any agency. I completely agree. Um, and then with this being both your directorial and like screenwriting for a movie debut, what did you learn from this experience that you'd like to take into future projects? And then on the flip side, what did you learn that would change your approach in the future? Mm, what a really good question. Um, in what I, a thing that I learned that, that I actually learned when I was still an actor from, um, uh, I was on a TV show that never went to air, but Gavin O'Connor directed it. Anthony Tambakis wrote it and Renee Zellweger produced it. And I, I got really close to them. They actually are the people that told me to make this into a screenplay. Um, but being on set with them, they were so kind and kind and nice are different, but kindness, kindness is the ability to anticipate the needs of others. Um, and they all had that and they were so generous with their crew, with the cast. Um, and so it was really important. And that all starts at the top and trickles everywhere. And so it was really important to me to, um, to also do that. My producing partner, Mary Margaret, uh, who produced this film, we wanted this movie to feel like summer camp. Um, and that meant being really selective with the crew and the cast to make sure that we were building a family. And that worked really well. And we have like a pretty strict no asshole policy, which also worked really well. So I, I will be taking that all the way because now we're a family. And like this whole movie was made with so much love from, from executive to crew. Um, and so that was really special. And then Something I would take with me in the future is, um, you know, once you get into post-production, there are a lot of, it's complicated. You know, there are a lot, like I'm a first time director, so I didn't, I don't get final say. I, most people don't get final say on anything. And I think there were a lot of instincts that I had that I was afraid to trust because the material is so complicated. Um, and I think I, I think I deliberately softened things that I wouldn't have 
otherwise, um, I think people can handle it. Um, so I, I think in the future, I will, I will trust my, trust my instincts more in, in post-production. I love that. I love that you said that kindness and niceness are different. Cause I literally have had that conversation with people. Yeah, they are. They are. And it's important to note the difference because communication doesn't like niceness is just being polite. Mm -hmm. Kindness, kindness is insight. Kindness is the highest form of intelligence. I think. I completely agree. And then can you talk to me a little bit about working with Jenna Ortega and Martin Freeman to both cultivate the chemistry between the characters, but also like really explore them as separate characters as well? Totally. I think that, you know, their, I mean, their chemistry is, is palpable. It's almost like a physical thing that you can reach out and touch. And I'm, you know, I've asked myself so many times, like what that is with actors, Gideon and Jenna have it too. Martin and Dagmara have it like Bashir and Dagmara have it. Like, I don't, and they've never met, you know, like these people have only met on set. So I wish I could, I, I don't know how to explain how chemistry happens. I guess it just happens or it doesn't. I think it's about, you know, finding people who have the right sort of sensitivities to each other or, or that are, I don't know, they get along. I honestly, I don't know, but Martin and Jenna both understood, understood these characters so, so well, and without a lot of explanation from me. So when we got into shooting, we, they knew all of the lines that it's obviously very, very dialogue heavy. So they came in like they were going to, like they were doing a play. They already knew all of their lines. So when we got in, we just got to play and we got to explore different things with, within the characters. Like Martin, you know, is so, he's a, a, a surgeon of an actor. He's so, he's so subtle and he's so deft, but he's really warm. And so his warmth and his humanity with Jonathan, I think allow you to relate to him. I think it would be really easy to vilify him if he was a certain way, but Martin feels like someone you care about. He is someone you care about. And then Jenna, you know, like Cairo, it would be so easy to make that character like really arch and really like, like a super villain, like too cold, you know, yeah. but Jenna, you feel her, you feel her heartbeat through the whole thing. Even when she has calcified, you can still feel that warmth inside of her. And so I think that, the humanity that both of them bring to these characters is what lets them be different from the trope of these, the trope that these characters normally present. Definitely. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Like I said, incredible job, especially with this being your first movie. Like I would not have been able to tell. So I'm very much, I'm very excited for what you, else you do in the future. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you so much.